Hey, it's Andrew Ams with ACR Commercial Roofing and Verde Landscape Companies. Welcome to this week's One Tribe Weekly. This is a special one. You're getting to see the inside of a One Tribe Live. We do this about every month where we bring in people from the field, from finance, administration, and we create some energy in the room that typically turns into even stronger messaging for the team to use, and you're gonna get to leverage now. This week, I talked about how elite leaders operate. And let me be clear, this is from me observing some of the highest leaders, most elite leaders in all fields across all industries. I took that message, I put it into four bullet points that my team is gonna use to lead more and win more, and you're gonna get access to that now. So without any more words from me, let's jump straight into this week's One Tribe Weekly. Okay, so I started out this meeting talking about Paul, which is, there's a few things about that. That's not very normal for me. Um, in fact, there's been a lot of ties back to um, the Bible this year that I, that I never really anticipated myself standing in front of people and talking about. So what are you smiling about? I don't pretend to be a scholar, by the way, nor do I pretend to be perfect, nor do I pretend any of that. When you guys hear me mention stuff like that, and, and I always say it, regardless of your faith or religion or whatever it is, um, what you'll find in whether you're watching a motivational video online, whatever it is, everything ties back to the same message. And it doesn't matter if it's the Bible or if it's the Torah or if it's whatever it is. There are tried and true practices, ways of living, um, ways of working that have worked from the beginning of time. And so the more I become engaged with personal development, how do I become better, how do I succeed, how do I operate out of you know, more kindness to people and help more people, what I end up finding is it, it all translates back to like this universal way of living or being. And it doesn't matter, again, if it's the Bible or if it's the, a number of different things. So when you guys hear me talking about that, don't think that I am a, a holy roller evangelist up here trying to say anything. Don't think that I am... A, um, acting as if I'm better understand, because I promise you there's at least two people, if not, I have a feeling you've got a pretty solid background in it, um, that know a lot more about the Bible than I, that have a lot better base. There's a lot of people that know a lot more than me is the point. The only reason I use those guys is try to tie back what I believe everybody in this room can at least say this person existed, there's a historical record of this guy, and how do we learn from that? But what I talked about a minute ago was Paul, and that most people don't think about him as, it, as, as, as a tent maker. They, they forget about the, the person, the human, the man that Paul was. All you hear and all you know is he wrote some of the New Testament. Maybe you don't even know that, right? I bring it to light. Hey, he, he wrote the majority of it. We think about him as apostle. We think about all that. But we forget that he was a man. He was a person. He had a trade or a craft that he utilized to be one of the biggest impacts in Western society, which we all live in, maybe ever. A lot of the writings that are in the New Testament, you guys have either, you think you may not recognize it, but you've lived a part of your life by, it's influenced you, or it's influenced some other writing that you have adopted as a way of, of, of living, a way of being, or a certain moral compass, right? So we forget about the fact that this guy was a tent maker above all else initially. And he utilized that craft to be in proximity with more people and share more of what his overall calling of a human being was. But he used tent making to do that. So what I said when I ended the first half of this, before we moved through our wins and all that kind of stuff, is that wouldn't you agree that if we are to take these core values up here, and if we're to live the absolute best life that we can, whether that be faith, family, finance, fitness, the four areas that we talk about, if that's what our goal is, then we each individually need to consistently be developing as leaders. Would you guys agree that? If, if that's the goal. And not only, there were plenty of leaders 
in the Bible. There are plenty of leaders in all historic texts. There's plenty of leaders out there today. But being an elite leader, a top-level leader, are the ones that make the difference. They're the ones who have the breakthroughs, the ones who do those awesome and big things, right? The elite leaders who know what their purpose, their mission, what they're supposed to be doing, and how, more importantly than all, how they can replicate wins over time in themselves and in other people. That may be the most key thing, and I haven't mentioned it yet, is that you got to be able to replicate wins, but you got to be able to replicate wins in other people. So what I'm going to go over today is something that I've realized by being around elite leaders. There's some traits and there's some things that they do that I've studied and I've watched. So I don't pretend, just as I don't pretend to be a biblical scholar, I don't pretend to have perfected these things, but I have been lucky and blessed to be in the room with some pretty powerful people over the last couple of years, learn directly from some of them, and there's some traits um, that these highly, very elite leaders follow. And you may be surprised, but I'm going to go through those today. Okay, so everybody can use these, and it doesn't matter what level of leadership you're at. Okay, so the, the, the topic of this is, is how elite leaders operate. So how do elite leaders operate? This is what every single one of you guys need to do because it's going back to my conversation earlier or what I said earlier, we've built up the energy. Now we need to exponentially grow that, right? We need to repeat that. So there's, full rule, or there's four traits that I've seen and things that you need to do. And I'm, I'm reading my notes to make sure I catch them exactly right. But the first one is, is you can't do everything yourself, but everything you can do yourself, you should. Okay, so number one is you can't do everything, but everything you can do yourself, you should. Let me tell you why that's important. That's not an efficiency thing. That's not me saying that you shouldn't delegate and there shouldn't be people on your team to do stuff. But even though you can't do everything and you can't do everybody's job and you can't do all that, everything that is in your power to do to bring the best result, you should do it. And there's a few reasons why for that. I'll start with just the obvious here. If there's anything extra in your control as a leader that you can do to make a, be to make a job go better, to make a cell go more efficient, to make the finances more clean, you should do it. You should never, because you're in a stance of leadership or have a title of leadership, that just because you have the power to do something, you decide not to because you're in a position of leadership, right? That, that people who do that are people who live by the title of leadership, not by actually being a leader, right? You've probably heard people say, and, and I think I've given the analogy here before, that being a leader in any field is like being the tip of the sword, right? It gets the dirtiest. You got to do the most work. You got to you you got to be able to prove and show your team how to do things, right? And if you're a leader who just lives by the title of leadership, well, you can have that for a minute. Who, who here has had a boss or somebody uh, in your past that was a leader just by title, but had no idea what they were doing, right? No idea. There's not many people. I don't think there's any in this room that are that way that have no idea. But there are people, and you've got to be very careful as you step into leadership and you are bestowed the responsibility to lead people that you don't ever adopt this whole mindset that I don't have to do anything now because I'm the leader. Okay, so you can't do everything yourself, which you need to recognize. You need to recognize. I need a mirror. I need to recognize. But everything you can do yourself, you should do. Okay, so that's number one. The number two point that elite leaders do and they operate based off of, and they know, rather, is the greatest teacher or boss can never replace learning from the process. Okay? So the greatest, I'll say boss, since we're in, in here, can never replace learning through the process. What does that mean? It means that it is so easy now for people to try to hit the easy button. 
Me too. Like, I, I don't think this is me saying this to you guys. It is way easier for me to try to text Ed or Andy or Charles or somebody and just ask them the answer to a question because they're doing, their company may be doing 30 million or 300 million. It's way easier for me to text them. But I don't ever get the answers I need when I do that. And more times than not, what I find out is if I would have just done a little bit of research myself or put a little bit of work in myself, I would have arrived at a better answer. So elite leaders know that no matter who they have around them, especially bosses, managers, or teachers, they know that having the best of the best is good, but it will never replace learning through the process. Okay? I've had a, I've had a few instances that, of that this year. Actually, you know, the best example I can give is last year when I was learning directly from uh, one of the youngest brothers who founded Aspen Roofing. They're an $80 million company, all residential, which it's, uh, I bring that up because doing $80 million in all residential is a pretty big feat. That's a lot of volume. Well, I viewed them as possibly one of the best teachers, so I would constantly just ask them questions. Hey, how do you do this? Hey, where's your marketing material? Where's your pitch deck? Where's your all that stuff? Well, instead of me thinking about who am I, what is my company, the, the, the searching and the understanding, I replicated a lot of their stuff. How'd that work? Not very good. That's how I changed everything again. So elite leaders know that the, the, the greatest boss, the easy button, is never going to replace learning through the process. It's the same reason why when I talk to you guys about irrigation, it's the same reason I can send that email that I sent to you two uh, over the weekend about Oakmont. I could ask somebody, hey, what do I need to do here? But I learned through working irrigation, through doing those things, so I could quickly stop in two seconds and know, not that I know Verde was already on it, that's not my point, but by learning through the process, that's way more powerful than me asking somebody, hey, what's a bypass on an irrigation control? And they give me the answer right there, okay? So the number three point, and this is again, people in very high leadership, they know that more times than not, the most valuable person to them is the person next to them, not the person above them. Okay, so elite leaders know the most valuable person is next to them. Tim? Not above them. In other words, there are latent talents, experiences, unique things within everybody in this room that are at an individual's level or in the field or in the truck with them that need to be tapped, right, in order for everybody to grow. What I said just a second ago is becoming a leader and success over long range is not just recreating it for yourself, it's recreating it for, for others, right? So, so many times people go to the easy button, myself included, and I ask somebody a question or I seek guidance about something to somebody that has no relevant, that, that right now they're not in a position that anything that I'm asking them is relevant. So I could go ask Ed or Andy or some of these people like, hey, how do I handle HR stuff? How do I handle a better way to process incoming people? Well, shoot, it's been 20 years since they've done anything like that. They have no idea. They were in it at one point in time, but they're not anymore. So... Asking your peers and people around you and collaborating and having conversations and knowing what they know and utilizing that is important. The biggest momentum that I have had as a, as a business owner, I would say, in putting systems into place was collaborating with a guy named Charles Covey who is going through the same thing I'm going through right now. Far more than going and asking the guys at Aspen or asking Ed or Andy. Because when I say something to him, I say, hey, man, here's a challenge I'm going through right now. This is what I don't understand. He's like, yeah, man, I got the same thing. Bothers the hell out of me. Here's what I've found that's working for me. Maybe you try this. So the people that are right here next to us are oftentimes the most valuable. And I think, quite frankly, we as a team can experience a lot, a lot of growth if we would tap each other a little bit more for their knowledge. I was thinking about it on the way up here and I was just thinking about everybody's experience in this room that we don't utilize. And let me be clear before I say this, this does not mean that, I'm talking about collaboration, not conglomeration. I'm talking about collaborating people's positions and what people need to do, not conglomerating everybody's thing in just one mess of nobody has a role. <laughs> 
clarify that. But I was thinking, I was thinking about Shelly, like, sure, you have a strong background in accounting, you know finance, you know all that kind of stuff. But who knows that Shelly, for I don't know, I do not know how many years, but worked for a senior living property management company. Knows the ins and outs of it. Knows a lot of people. Right? How often have I consulted with her about how the people operate? Never. I haven't. I've never stopped to do that. We're entering a new era in our business to where we're consolidating our insurance. Prop, I mean, all of our insurance packages and all that kind of stuff. It's a guy sitting to my left that wrote the property programs for over $8 billion of real estate in risk. He's a risk management guy. I haven't asked him a single question. Not one. How should we manage this? What kind of stuff should we do? I don't know. You've only got one of the most valuable people you could ever have in that office over there, but we don't ask him anything. You just stay in your place, right? <laughs> like, there is a long list of things of the people that are right next to you that have the most value they can give to you to get through whatever it is you're working through, and elite leaders know that. And I'm, I'm starting to realize that. I, I didn't think about those two things, as sad as it is, until I walked in here preparing for this meeting. I was thinking, what are some of the talents of the people in this room that, that we have no... Tyler. This is okay, and Amy will be okay with me saying this. I put her in charge a few months ago of like IT stuff and, and all that at the office, servers, all those things. And she told me from day one, she goes, Andrew, I have no idea anything, but I'll give her hell. I don't think you said it that way, but she said, I'll do my best. Tyler's been on for three months now. I have constantly been sending stuff to her about all this until a couple weeks ago where we went through text messages, three pictures back and forth about the end of an HDMI cable. I was like, Tyler's sitting back there, and he's got like, and I mean this with all due respect, like the nerdiest stuff I've ever seen. <laughs> and I, I nerd out on stuff. Like, I love it. So I'm like, this guy's in here with some like little grid that, like we have, we have mouses and computers and our normal keyboards, but like he's in there working on something. Like he can punch this little like LED screen, and it like produces stuff. I don't, yeah, there's some preparation, but long story short, there's a person right next to you that knows all of this, you're coming to me, and I set it up that way. Like Again, I'm not without sin in any, in any part of what I try to set up. But you're coming to me. I can do the best that I can, but there's somebody right next to you that has the answer. So elite leaders know that, right? They start to tap into that. And then last and maybe most important thing that elite leaders operate by, and they know, this is important. If you're, if you're taking notes, take it. If you're not, just etch it into your, into your brain. Elite leaders know that just because they were wrong the last time doesn't mean they'll be wrong this time. Elite leaders and people who are, are, are making it and winning at a high level know that just because they were wrong the last time doesn't mean they're wrong this time. Okay? So the most easy analogy I can tie to that is sales. Right, because that, that's what I have the most experience in, and that's what I've done the most of, and a lot of times I see that as what drives businesses. Some of you guys know the story about three years ago, maybe four years ago, when I flew out to El Paso to try to sell a million dollar roof. Who knows that, who's heard me? Ben maybe the only one. So this is just what I was starting you know, in commercial roofing, and I thought I was, well, I don't know if I thought anything, but we landed a big lead, it was out in El Paso, and um, it, was, it was almost a million dollar deal. And I flew out there on a whim to go and pitch this guy on this re-roof of a lead that came in online. Well, first of all, he had, he had the most awesome conference room I've ever seen in my life. Like I'm talking a conference table from that wall all the way to here. I've already got nerves because I mean, I think the biggest roof I'd sold at that time was maybe $35,000. So I'm trying to go sell this million dollar roof. So I'm already nervous. I got a little bit of anxiety. Show up thinking I'm going to be able to say, hey, is so-and-so here? Them introduce me to him. I go talk to him. No, no, no. This is like a very formal beta trap, as I would call it. I'm the beta, alpha beta. Like they put me in a position to where it's like, yes, Mr. So-and-so will be here. He'll have eight minutes to talk to you and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, Vroom. like the, the walls start closing. I'm like, oh my gosh, I think I know this stuff. But so they walk me in. 
set me at the end of the conference table and say, he'll be here shortly. <laughs> I have to sit in this room and just think about, like, do I know what I'm talking That's about? A beta trap. A beta trap. It's not always intentionally set, but it's, it's set a lot of times in those scenarios to keep you on your toes, right? So anyways, I, I sit down. I probably have to wait five minutes. It's like a doctor's appointment, right? Like I got to wait in the lobby for him. Well, he comes in with his assistant aside, and he sits down like two or three space, just enough for it to be uncomfortable, right? He's like, why are you not sitting next to me? Or at least close. Long story short, um, he sits down. I collapse. Like I just, not collapse, I just lock up. I start sweating. I'm like, this roof is awesome. You're going to like it. Like, I think that's all that could come out of my mouth at that point. I was just like, I was, I mean, I had this whole proposal here. I was done. I didn't get the job. I'll put it, I'll, I'll put it that way. I didn't, not even close. Like I left and you probably, I know where I was standing when I called her because I was so defeated. I was like, I just got chewed up and spit out. I looked like an idiot. Well, I just told you guys a story a minute ago that we're easily closing $800,000 jobs, national contracts. Um, just because I was wrong in that one scenario, then I had no idea what I was doing doesn't mean I'm wrong now. And so many people, because they get chewed up by that one beta trap, are done forever. And that's the same in this little tribe right here. If you say something or you bring an idea or whatever it is and your coworker doesn't think it's right, and maybe you get your, your, your feelings hurt a little bit, just like mine where I was devastated. I was like, I suck. I need to go back to like mowing my friend's yards. That was awful. You know, uh, Just because I was wrong then doesn't mean I'm wrong now. So the constant evolution of kind of going through this loop, right? Just because I was wrong then doesn't mean I'm wrong this time, right? And every single time that I fail or my idea or whatever, or my sales pitch didn't work, well, I can go, always go right back to the top of this loop here. I can realize, you know what? I didn't do that one. I didn't get that deal. And I can't do everything myself, but everything I can do, I should. So if there's something I can do to learn from that, what is a beta trap? How do I understand what position he put me in? And how do next time I get my up out of that seat and go sit next to him? So how do I learn more? Then, of course, the next, the, the, the greatest boss in the world can't replace learning through the process. I will never in my life be put in that situation again. And I could have a million people tell me that, hey, one day you'll be intimidated by people. One day you'll have some guy who puts you in what's called the beta trap to where you, he tries to intimidate you. But you know what? Without having that feeling and knowing how bad it freaking sucked to walk out of that conference room, I would never have the courage to now, if they put me in that position again, I would get my butt up and I would walk down and get close to them and say, hey, come here, buddy, let's look at this. Because I know how bad that sucked. So learning through the process is critical way more than anybody that gives you the answer. And the most valuable person is the person sitting next to you, not the person above you. It kind of all goes back to that, right? If I would have had somebody in my life at that point, like Charles or somebody like that, to say, hey, I'm going to meet this guy, maybe he would have just similar, just went through a situation like that. And he could say, hey, man, here's the key. But you try to ask somebody who's, who's 30 layers ahead of you or you are at this current, current time, they've already built up all the confidence. They already know how to handle it. So whatever they translate to you ain't going to work for you. Right, The person next to you has got an immense amount of power there. So I lay these four things out as things that I've observed in some of these people that I'm working with. I, I, I just have just been lucky. I told you guys I walked into some of the coaching programs and all that stuff that I've done this last year with the intent of a few things. One of the number one things was not to learn what are these guys throwing at me, the content, but how are they acting? What do they know? What's the common denominator in these people? Because you can look at successful people from a wide array of backgrounds. Some are very successful in their faith. Some are su successful in their relationships, some financially. But there's a common denominator in all of them. And every single one of them, first of all, they're involved in, in, in some sort of personal development. They're involved in groups like these. But they're all elite leaders in that area. And they all practice these things right here. And I'm confident you go back to what I was talking about earlier, being an elite leader in our industry is going to cause the power and give us the ability to take this to a whole nother level. I don't want to be just the best roofer, the best landscaper, somebody who in Lubbock, Texas or West Texas did something pretty neat that one time. Going back to our first one tribe, I want it to be like 
We talked about Xerox. We talked about how people like that define an industry. Like for a long time, you literally said, hey, will you Xerox this for me? Will you give me a Coke? Right? Those people understood the bigger picture. Like now those are kind of old antiquated brands, I get it. But that's what we need to do and that's gonna take individual leadership at all levels. So when we walk into this week and into this month, follow the process, know that we have grown a little bit, but even for Verde, who's on track right now, more so than we are from a hard number standpoint, if we wanna knock this out of the park, we wanna stand here at our first One Tribe Live in 2021 and go, golly, what happened? Like we, we had a little bit of that this over the last couple of months, but I wanna stand here in 2021 and just like almost sit here for an hour laughing about like, what in the heck happened in the last six months? I think I got a taste of that today. Would you guys agree that this was the first one tribe we set here and it was like very comfortable, easy, like, oh, this happened and that was big. This happened and that was big. So the way that we take this and we allow today to be one of the many points that turns us into an exponential growth phase is we know that we are in the landscaping and roofing industry, but we're here to do something bigger and what is that? We're here to enhance the quality of life for everybody we touch. That's it. If we can deliver that through landscaping, we can deliver that through roofing. The, if you can coach him and teach him to run a better job, and we're supposed to put on good roofs. That's a part of it. But if you coach him and teach him, that's invaluable. And that's, that's what we need to be doing out there. If we can continue recreating experiences to people who say, that's the, best, that's the nicest thing that's happened to me, and I don't know how long. We continue to empower our team members to grow and be better and be a part of this. We've done something. Just put on a roof ain't anything. Yeah. Hey, thanks for jumping inside the One Tribe Live. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope the four points will help you lead, whether it be your team, your family, or yourself in a more effective way. If you enjoyed this, the full playlist of One Tribe Weekly is right over here and click here. You can see the last one that you may have missed. We'll see you on the other side.